people need to change their habits from <laughs> from the intervention. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to the new season of our seminars, and it's a huge personal pleasure to uh, welcome Professor Dr. Bernard Homel, who is a dear colleague, very established colleague, and a, and a, a dear friend. He's a full professor of psychology at the Shandong Normal University in Jinan, China. From 99 to 2022, he held a chair of general psychology in Leiden University after having worked as a senior researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Psychological Research. His PhD was at the University of Bielefeld in 1990. Bernard, I heard that Bielefeld is a city that doesn't exist, right? I, you had what? I heard that Bielefeld is a city that doesn't exist. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Exactly. That's the <laughs> famous course. song. Yeah. Habilitation yes. at Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich in 97. He's a member and, and a senator of the German National Academy of Sciences and the highest ranking researcher in the field of psychology and cognitive sciences in all of China. He was co-founder and board member of the Leiden Institute of Brain for Brain Cognition and president of the European Society for Cognitive and Affective Neuroscience. His research focuses on cognitive, computational, developmental, social, and neurochemical mechanisms of human and robotic attention and action control and the role of consciousness therein. I'll stop here while I'm reading just to say that it might, for those who don't know Bernard, it sounds like he's spreading himself too thinly, but I think uh, part of his creativity allows him really to touch on all these topics and, and, and provide major contributions uh, in all of them. So uh, it's a great pleasure to be listening to his talk today. He published more than uh, 400 and something articles. I just looked you up on Google Scholar today for the first time. My goodness, your H index is what, 100 and something. Uh, very, very active in, in uh, very diverse topics. He even publishes textbooks and general audience books that apply psychological and neuroscientific insights to politics. So anything from creativity, uh, perception, uh, control, thought, and and and, uh, and politics. So uh, it's a great pleasure to have somebody so multidisciplinary uh, open up our season. And uh, the floor is yours, Bernard. Thank you. Thank you for the for the invitation. Uh, hopefully, uh, physically at some point. Uh, but now let's let's do this. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad and honored to be invited. Uh, and I, what I would, would like to do today is to, to talk about meta control, uh, which is basically um, inviting you to share my dissatisfaction with the uh, old fashioned cognitive control view, uh, the way that we, let's say the, the view that we have uh, kind of inherited from philosophers and, and others. So what, what is this about? Uh, this is uh, basically, does it work? No, yeah. it's not working. Ideally, you would see the Super Mario uh, in, the, in the green field running and running and overcoming all obstacles in the way that's not apparently in, in Zoom, it's not not working. And that is, I think, pretty much the way that we uh, traditionally uh, see uh, cognitive control to work. So it's basically our common sense idea of willpower, right? So if you try very hard and that feel, doesn't feel very comfortable, uh, then, then you can overcome all the obstacles on the way. Uh, so task persistence is clearly the idea here. There are different ways. Miller and Cohen would think that this is a frontal lobe function that kind of enslaves all the other lower, as it were, uh, systems in order to do a particular task. Uh, or Shellis and many, many others, Kornblum and who, what have you, uh, have this idea that there is automatic processing quite a bit, sensory motor, but whenever there are obstacles, when there are problems to overcome, then the supervisory system, uh, some kind of magic homunculus, uh, is intervening and doing things that we do not fully understand, but in the uh, to the effect that in the end we reach what we what we want, uh, and that if that is not working well, then we become addicts or become obese or do crazy stuff. So that is our basic idea, and I, I think that's fine. I can see many, and of course we 
We devise tasks according to that, like the stroop task, the flanker task, things where we are tempted to do something, but should actually do something else. Uh, and the, to the degree that we can do that, we are supposed to have a will and a supervisory function. Uh, and that's all good. I can imagine many situations where this is important, but I think it's only half of the, of the, of the story, uh, one, one side of the coin so to speak. And indeed, there is increasing evidence from different angles. Uh, so some like Goshka are talking more from conceptual point of view, Coles and Desposito more from a kind of uh, neuromodular point of view or based on patient research. Uh, others like Dorstevitz would more come from a kind of receptor family uh, story. But the, the, the story is always the same, namely that, uh, yes, there is whatever you call it, stability, prefrontal functioning, frontal lobe functioning, uh, D1 receptor family functioning, and so forth and so on. And yes, all that is important for working memory, go presentation, uh, top-down reasoning, and so forth and so on. But there is something else. And that is when we are supposed to be flexible, think out of the box, do something crazy, uh, do something really novel. Uh, and then we don't really can rely so much on persistence and on, on, on our knowledge, uh, but we have to invent something new. We have to become open uh, to external and also internal novel ideas. And that is supposedly a different system, different function, whatever you call it. I call it flexibility uh, and uh, persistence and flexibility uh, are the two yin and yang parts that together, I believe, are what we what we have to think about cognitive control. So it can make us more persistent, go into depth, uh, concentrate, exclude, monopolize, but it can also do the opposite. It can uh, open us up, uh, let us more become more relaxed uh, and so forth and so on. And this is not just the opposite of of being in control, it is one other way of being in control about other things for other purposes. Yeah, so that I, is- can I, can I interrupt you now just for a second? Sure. I see yes. myself as part of your, your slides. I think I'm just, can you remove my face from your slides? I think it's on your screen. <laughs> yeah, okay. great, thank like you this? very much. Yes, yes. Thank okay, you. oh yeah. <laughs> so you were overlaying with the VTA. We have to think later what that means. Uh, anyway, um, good. So I continue. Then the next thing, uh, the, the next question was, um, how do you? Um, well, let me let me try to move your uh, without any face and without any feedback. So you have to shout loud if I'm, if something goes wrong. Anyway, um, uh, but you're still there. Hello. Yes. Yes. Are you still here? Yeah. Ah, yeah. because if, if you if you're gone, if I remove. Why would I be gone? Move Why your picture, your sound. <laughs> okay, yeah. now I try to move you somewhere else, perhaps here, <laughs> if that's okay. Good. So the next question was, yes, that's all good, but what does that mean computationally? Because, uh, I mean, how, do you, how are you persistent versus flexible? In order to get an idea about, uh, about that, I, uh, was, uh, I stumbled across a... Nice text pay from Bogac uh, that uh, who who tried to look into all biologically plausible decision making models and tried to extract the commonalities and think about what 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 is the essence of human decision making in the brain and he came up with two ideas uh, or two let's say components that are that are uh, common to most uh, decision-making models. And one is obviously top-down control. So our goals are somehow affecting the way we make decisions. So if I struggle between alternative A and B, uh, and I don't know which is the, the best one, then my current goal is likely to, to kind of favor some of these representations over others so that I'm more likely it's not determining this choice, but it's more likely that I will uh, pick the one that is consistent with my goals. And the other is competition. The brain is competitive. 
uh, actually from the very early sensory organs on. Uh, so wherever you go, you have winners and you have losers. Uh, and so uh, these were, are the two basic ingredients of, of uh, information processing. Now, if that is true, then the next question is, how can I be, how can I introduce uh, inter-individual and intra-individual variability? Because if I can be persistent and next moment I can be flexible, that means that I can change myself so I can generate in intra-individual variability. And perhaps also pe people are different. So some people are more persistent, other people are more flexible in general, on average. Uh, so how, 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 can I combine that with this model? That was my question. And here's the idea. Uh, no, that's wrong. Here's the idea. One, if in order to be persistent, I may actually emphasize both factors. I may increase the impact the goal has on my decision making, and I can increase the competition uh, that renders me, let's say, that turns me into kind of single channel mo uh, uh, system. Uh, in the sense that I'm only into A or into B, but never into both. Whereas if I want to be flexible, I do the opposite. I reduce the impact of the goal and the competition so that perhaps A and B and C and D can survive and cooperate so that I can now have many ideas uh, and not necessarily a mutually exclusive uh, way to, to deal with them. So that, that is the basic idea that, and then we took this idea and looked into, it's just, I briefly rushed through, you can look this paper up. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of overview of what we know from, from genes and from social factors. Uh, and indeed, what we found here is that there are uh, polymorphisms that, they, that are, uh, let's say, if, to the degree that they in, increase the functioning of the prefrontal uh, part of the of the system, which is supposedly mainly underlying or supporting, um, then people these people with these uh, polymorphisms are uh, are better uh, outperforming others in tasks that rely on persistence, like this troop task and uh, things like that. Uh, whereas people who have a better functioning to have a uh, let's say genetic predisposition for a better functioning striatal uh, system which is supposedly supporting flexibility uh, and openness, then these guys are better in tasks that um, that are rely or requiring a certain degree of flexibility and uh, and are not of the Stroop kind and vice versa. So this is not always fully symmetric, but if there is a tendency, then the uh, the with a, a frontal. Uh, support, let's say genetic prefrontal support, uh, performing worse in uh, um, flexible tasks and vice versa. So that looked okay. Uh, for that. And then how about cultural? Now there we were particularly interested in cultural factors that can be kind of related to something. That's why I find religion interesting uh, because religion is certainly a cultural factor, but in contrast to culture, it is a kind of better constrained in the sense that there are at least uh, theories about how you should, uh, let's say, embody an, a particular religion, whereas there is no screen, no script that tells you how to be a good German. Um, whereas uh, there are scripts that tell you how to be a good Jew or Christian or uh, Muslim or whatever. And of course, we know that people are not always reading these books and following what the, what, what the books are telling them, but at least this is a good proxy, we thought. And that's why we found religion particularly interesting um, for especially for experimental purposes and particularly interesting cultural factor. Anyway. The nutshell here is that whenever you, you encounter a culture or subculture or religion that has a very strong individualistic uh, mindset or pro promotes an individualistic mindset, then these people are better in persistence heavy tasks like the Stroop task. Uh, so for instance, uh, uh, Protestants, uh, very heavy, uh, let's say, very religious people, 
uh, who are very Protestant are extremely individualistic. They are at the, let's say the Netherlands are at the top five of the individualistic scores on, in the Hofstede scale. Uh, and they uh, are having hardly any Simon effect. Uh, so uh, they, whenever you tell them something, they do that. And that if you ask them to ignore other information, they can do that very well. Whereas collectivistic cultures or, or religions or other cultural subcultures, which were kind of are more promoting collectivistic mindsets, uh, then these people are much better in flexible heavy tasks, but not so good in, uh, in persistence heavy tasks. So they have a big uh, Simon F. So, for instance, Catholics uh, in Italy have a much bigger Simon effect than Germans and way bigger than uh, the Dutch people. Anyway, so, uh, so so much about, let's say, uh, basic tasks, what, what we believe are basic tasks, they are heavily penetrated by genetic and uh, cultural um, factors. All right. This is good. This is the past that we did many studies playing around with, uh, let's say, meditation and other ways, mood uh, and so forth, where we try to induce more persistent or more, more flexible mindsets. Uh, that worked okay, sometimes better, sometimes worse. Uh, big individual differences, uh, very difficult to test whether you, to, let's say, to make manipulation checks it's because we cannot measure meta control directly. It would be cool to open the skull and see, oh, where are you currently on this scale, ideally from between extreme persistence and extreme flexibility. So, and this is what we try to, to improve on here in, in China. So in the beginning that was difficult. So we, because there was uh, the pandemic and it was very hard to collect data. So we borrowed quite a number of data from other people uh, and tried to play around with them. Uh, and here's what we found. So first, let's think about how could we measure this? So what could the brain look like if we are persistent versus flexible? How could that, what could that be? Think about this. Now think about being persistent. That means that you have a strong inter, uh, let's say um, 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 uh, a strong mutual comp Petition between alternative representations. That should make the brain relatively silent. Whereas if you allow for many things to happen at the same time, if you want to be flexible, you should have a pretty noisy brain. So that was the, the basic idea. Here's the sub task where you would like to be persistent where, and the, uh, convergent thinking, the same thing, whereas divergent thinking, so out of the box thinking, you want to be flexible. So you want to allow for many ideas happening at about the same time. Um, so that gave us the idea that perhaps here's a, a kind of landscapes for supposedly young and old people. So old, you know, uh, myelin is disappearing magically. So you become a noisy brain, you get a noisy brain uh, over time. Um, I can tell you, yes, that is true. Um, and that may be how it looks like. And if that is true, then it may be that the young brain would be particularly looking like you if you would be persistent, whereas the old brain looks more like people who are flexible. Not that old people are flexible, but that's another story. Okay, but you get my, hopefully you get my idea that persistence may be related to less noise in the brain and flexibility to more noise in the brain because you allow for more, more noise to happen. Now, coming from that, here's the first data set from fMRI where we looked into standard deviations uh, and the size of the Stroop effect and you see a systematic relationship. So the standard deviation in the fMRI signal uh, and there were different locations, the, loc the areas were, uh, I'm not getting into these details, uh, but uh, what you can see is that there is a positive relationship. Uh, the, the more, let's say, noise, you can argue about whether that is noise, there will be a better example later on, uh, but um, we are currently actually looking into that in more depth uh, to see which measure is actually 
capturing which part of the noisiness of brains uh, under which circumstances, but this is the first shot that we did. And you can see a positive relationship and you can also see convergent thinking, uh, which uh, where you see it, the scale is, is different, but again, you see that um, the more noisy people are, the less good they are doing it with a convergent thinking. Unfortunately, there was no, yes. Can I ask you a question? Sure. So why do you call it noisy then? I mean, when you're inflexible, you're just entertaining more possibilities. So this is a legitimate activity that just represents multiple routes or multiple possible paths rather than just a one habitual uh, string. Uh, um, oh yeah, okay. Uh, that, rigid, that, that... yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, we were using resting state, uh, resting state uh, measures to measure the noise. So we didn't measure the noise during the task. I see. I see. During okay. the yeah. so we measured the kind of spontaneous variability, if you will, that people entertain. And again, I fully agree. Noise is is difficult with respect to that. There will be more convey. Hopefully, I will convince you in the next slide uh, that but that still, was... for for me. Uh, noise means something that we don't want to, to have. And if you say that, in no, 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 state, no, no, I just what? No, 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 I I disagree with, with that. But uh, let's get back to that. Give give me one more slide, and then uh, because then indeed we thought uh, now it may be more interesting to use the, the FOOF uh, uh, algorithm, uh, which basically it d disentangles uh, the, let's say, periodic activity that, that people are interested in in the field uh, and extracts what is left if you, if you take that out. So it, takes, it measures only, uh, it extracts the aperiodic part of the EEG signal, if you will, uh, and then you, you do that by approximating the function and, and taking the exponent. And the idea is that the higher the exponent, the less pronounced is the aperiodic activity. Now, if, you, if, you, if I can loosely speak and translate high aperiodic activity into greater noise, here you may agree more easily perhaps, because this is really something that EEG experts think we should not have. And I want to convince you otherwise. I think, and that, that is an approach from physics, uh, people who are arguing that we may be wrong in assuming that this real noise is useless. No, no, it may be exactly what we need to, to approach, or let's say to master some functions or some tasks. Uh, and I try to convince you that this is actually what happened. Anyway, first, here's some data, uh, and what, what it shows is a go-no-go -no -go task, uh, where, however, the go uh, trials are extremely frequent. So you are kind of set to go, if you will, and have a, you have a relatively hard time to suppress the no-go signal, uh, the no-go uh, response. No, that's wrong. You have a hard time to suppress your response when the no-go signal is presented. That's the right way to put it. Is that, does that make sense? Uh, so the, the no-go trial is the diff more difficult here. Uh, there's also congruency, but what you can see is the aperiodic exponent from the FOOF uh, calculation. Uh, and that shows you that in the no-go trial, the exponent is higher, meaning that the noise is reduced. So in other words, whenever things are getting tough, whenever you need to focus, then you reduce the noise in your brain or more, let's say, correctly speaking, uh, you reduce the aperiodic part of your brain activity. Is that, does that make sense? Okay, good. So, uh, and interestingly, we looked into the, uh, the pre-stimulus phase and the post-stimulus phase, and there was nothing uh, in the pre-stimulus phase, meaning that you, it's, this is really only happening in the trial. So whenever the stimulus is presented, the, the, let's say the processing of the stimulus is triggering this reduction of the noise. All right. So then we took uh, data from a flanker task, uh, 
uh, where uh, the original study was actually interested in the uh, uh, conflict monitoring and resolution. As you know, there are, there are different ideas about conflict monitoring, uh, that whenever we have an incongruent flanker, like you see here in the middle, uh, so where the flanker is incongruent with the target, which is in the middle, then you experience conflict. Now that conflict may be a signal for you to activate, it's picked up, so the idea from what Vinick and others uh, picked up by the, by the ACC, uh, which then signals to the prefrontal cortex that uh, there should be an increase in, in influence on other components. Uh, and then the, the uh, task representation or the, the goal representation is strengthened and thereby you reduce the conflict uh, and improve performance in the next trial uh, if this is an, if you're again encountering incongruent uh, uh, information. Now that is that that is the idea, but here we had the opportunity to also monitor the the uh, the foof exponent over time. So basically, what you see here is is the target n, so which is starting with a stimulus, um, and then you see that if you have an incongruent condition. Uh, the again, the exponent is increased, uh, meaning that you reduce the aperiodic exponent. Uh, probably you, uh, the aperiodic part of the activity, the brain activity, that is, you reduce the noise in your brain. The same holds for the next, the pre, let's say we're, there we looked into the next trial. This is the middle uh, pair of the, of the two bars. Um, where you have basically find the same thing until the stimulus appears. But when the stimulus appears, these, this is the right pair of the bars, uh, then you see that the effect reverses. Now, this means that there is a noise reduction in the more top-down demanding, namely the incongruent condition. And that transfers to later stages, which is, uh, uh, in, which would also fit with Botvinnik, but also with Holroyd and, Col uh, Holroyd and Colts and others who assume that the main action actually uh, is happening in the next trial and not in the current trial. And indeed, if we try to use the component and correlate it with the congruency effect in the current trial N, then there is no correlation, meaning that the re noise reduction and the the effect, the reaction time effect that you see, the congruency effect, are basically both happening at the same time, but one is not depending on the other, which means that you eventually respond in the incongruent condition, not because you reduce the noise in your brain, which then enabled you to, to, to nevertheless respond correctly, but both are, you, you, you trigger the reduction of the noise, but that is no, not affecting your current ongoing processing, but it only affects the processing in the next trial, which I think is an interesting issue because this is the first time you can really disentangle these two uh, theories uh, with this kind of uh, close following up uh, on, in, in time of what, what's, what's happening there. Uh, then we used, uh, we, we, we used a study uh, where uh, their uh, methyl phenidate was, uh, was uh, provided to participants. These are healthy participants, but the, the drug is typically used for ADHD. Uh, now, if you assume that ADHD uh, is presumably a hyper flexibility, that people have a pretty noisy brain uh, on average, and the drug is, is improving situations, you may assume that the drug is moving you on this, uh, this meta-control uh, dimension from the right to the middle or to the, in, in, the, in the left direction, right? So that is the idea. Uh, and that is why we carried out this or analyzed this study. And here's what you see, it's pretty busy, but what you see, first of all, is that it's only within trial uh, stuff that is going on. So the, the drug has no impact on pretrial activity, so, which it could have because it is a drug, um, but it doesn't. Uh, it only affects the processing itself. It does not affect the activity, the neural activity, before you start processing a stimulus. 
And the second, oh, here's the summary. The noise reduction um, is again restricted to the more top-down demanding conditions, which is the incongruent condition, incompatible condition. I'm not going, it's a complicated design, but it's always the same logic, namely that if you create conflict, then it is more demanding. Um, and uh, in that, in these conditions, you find an increase. However, what you see on the right, uh, on the rightmost um, column, the, the, the four bars on the, on the right, is that this is an under additive effect that is, uh, it's not increasing anymore. So it's an under additivity of drug incongruence and incompatibility incompatibility, meaning that you do not reduce, 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 but at some point there is no longer any possibility, so it seems, to reduce the noise in your brain. So there seems to be an upper limit, physical limit, uh, we suggest, uh, where uh, you can no longer do that. Now that is interesting also for ADH, uh, ADHD uh, um, treatment uh, because it might be interesting to see whether different people have different upper limits and whether that affects the way you should treat them with drugs or other uh, kind of uh, treatments. Okay, now then we again uh, looked into resting state, but this time with EEG. Uh, so people had a resting state a measurement and we took uh, their, uh, their exponent from there, then the uh, mean split at the two groups. Uh, and what you can then see, what you can see is two, uh, two effects. Uh, first of all, uh, there's a noise reduction in the more top down demanding condition in the no-go. The no-go was again, very, very infrequent. So it was very hard to suppress uh, the go response. That is a replication of what we found before. But more interesting was this. On the left, you see the group uh, with uh, a high noise. That is, these people have a, a low resting state exponent. And on the right, you see the group with a higher exponent, meaning that they have, a, have less spontaneous noise uh, uh, as measured by the exponent. And what you can see here is that the, uh, in the, in the uh, low noise group, there is hardly any adjustment to the go no go condition, uh, which is actually not significant. So they just stay where they are, namely with their not noisy brain, uh, and they get what they what comes, as it were. Whereas the uh, the high noise group adjusts as we know, namely in the sense that in the no-go condition, they, they reduce the noise, that is they increase their exponent um, according to, to the, the task uh, demands, if you will. But again, they never reach the, the other group, uh, which is not trivial because this is not the data that we use to categorize the two groups. This is coming from another condition, namely the resting state, uh, which was uh, taken on another in another session. All right. So um, then we looked into development, uh, developmental data. So we looked into kids. Uh, how? Wait, wait a second. How, just checking the time. I, I think I'm still okay in time. Um, so we, we, we looked into da data from, from people between, I think it was eight and 30 or something, um, in order to, to, to see what, what's going on there. Again, you see nothing in the pretrial uh, period apart from uh, not quite uh, significant, I, if, I, if I remember cor correctly, uh, difference between children and adults. But in the within trial, there's the action not so much uh, in the case of the children that who do not adjust to go and no go uh, conditions, but only the adults do. So the adults replicate our previous findings, namely that you reduce the noise in the more difficult no go condition, uh, whereas the kids cannot apparently. So it seems uh, they cannot adjust to that. Uh, now, if you then, uh, you may then worry about the, the categorization. So we also use a more continuous measure, uh, age. And there you can see a very systematic relationship 
um, between the the effect size and the and the age. So the the older you get, the more the bigger bigger the difference between go and no go, and between pretrial and within trial. So you have a kind of ready steady go response. So you reduce the noise whenever the stimulus appears, and you do more so the older you are until you are a young adult. Uh, there are data from another group, um, from the Gaselli group, showing the opposite for old, older people. So they compared young adults with old adults, and there you basically find the opposite effect, uh, kind of converging to an inverted U-shape uh, function. Um, and for the rest, yeah, you would, you, you, this is what you would expect, namely that younger brains are more noisy. Uh, suggesting uh, that the, the, the slow uh, maturation of the prefrontal cortex uh, is kind of useful for reducing the noise whenever needed um, to make it more persistent. That would be at least a, the story that would be um, fitting to the major control story where the prefrontal cortex is the main site important for, in, in, let's say, uh, creating persistence, which again means reducing the noise. All right, um, then we looked into creativity. Uh, again, uh, there are two, at least two different ways to be creative. Uh, that is at least what Guilford rightly argued, uh, I believe. Which And the standard tasks to tap into that are the AUT and the RAT. Now, if you're not familiar with that, uh, the AUT is very simple. I show you something like, like a pen or a brick, and then I give you, let's say three minutes to write up or tell me what you can do with it. And obviously there are more interesting answers and less interesting answers. Yes, you can write with a pen. Uh, you can leave a note. Yes, yes, yes. But you, you can also do crazy stuff like sticking it into the right eye of your supervisor or stuff like that. I'm not saying you should do that, but uh, there, there are more creative and less creative answers. They are rated accordingly and so forth and so on. Uh, but this is what we believe is out of the box thinking. This is the divergent thinking uh, aspect. Whereas the RAT, the uh, um, remote associate task, is looking into convergent thinking. And here you have a very constrained search for a solution. So you would get three words like cocktail, dress, and birthday. And then you would look for the one word that can be combined with all three of them. So one, my favorite example is uh, man, glue, and market. And then there is just one word that can go with all three. And that is, of course, super. Exactly. So we we thought about how how to how to go to look into that. The idea was that uh, the AUT relies on flexibility, whereas more on flexibility, let's say, uh, and the RAT more on persistence than uh, the AUT. So. Um, what we found was uh, this, that divergent thinking comes with more noise, as you can see here on the DT is divergent thinking and the CT is the convergent thinking. And there's a lot of variability, but you see that on average statistically, uh, the convergent thinking is clearly uh, associated with less noise or with a higher exponent uh, than the divergent thinking task. Um, so what, what you can see here is that, again, this is specific for the task period. It's, so it's not a blocked effect, as it were. It's not that if whenever you are somewhere engaging in a block uh, where you do in, uh, divergent thinking that, that, that you change the noisiness of your brain, but you wait for the trial, and only then you adjust your, your brain uh, periodicity, if you will. Uh, that is what, what you see here. Uh, and here is our speculation why that is, and that gives you some, some idea. Again, uh, I think Moshe said that uh, brain noise is something that we don't want. And I think, yes, we do want it, because if we really want, I mean, let's think about what out-of-the-box thinking is. 
It means getting rid of all the knowledge, of all the intuition, of all the previous experience that you have. You don't want, our brain is extremely effect, effective in storing all the information, all the experiences that we encountered. And that's very cool uh, because we can collect that and use it later. But in some cases, and this is one of them, I think, where when you want to do divergent thinking, out of the box thinking, you want to get rid of all of that. And the best way is to, to, to make the signal noisy so that you have to find out something new. That is our, our uh, account of that. Now, the last one is, I think, uh, is the uh, is working memory again? This is the Kessler task, and it, this is incredibly complicated. I'm not going into the details at all, but we were interested uh, in the closing and the opening, which uh, which uh, this particular task version allows to disentangle. Because we so sometimes when you do run through this task, so you have to to keep the reference, and then you have to wait until another stimulus appears. Uh, and so forth and so on. So the idea is that there are conditions where you have to, to keep what you have in your memory. And there are other situations where you have open up your working memory and let in something new. And these are two conditions we were interested in. And in two studies, we found the same, namely, again, the pretrial doesn't do anything, which is good. That, so we have really specific stuff going on. And second, closing is not related to any changes uh, in, uh, in the aperiodic uh, exponent. It, it's only opening because there, that's our interpretation, there you need to select. You make, need to make a new selection. You don't keep, you select something new for keeping. And that is what is similar to the go no go task to the flanker task to the whatever this this aspect and that's why the main effect here uh, of the exponent is only restricted to the opening condition so let's let me summarize people seem to control their style of control which i call meta control and which i be believe uh, between the two extreme poles of persistence and flexibility. Uh, I think we have reasons to believe that meta control is reflected by cortical noise in the sense of brain variability. Again, you can argue about this and we will later on like, like to get deeper into this, but the FOOF exponent I think is a very good example for, for this aperiodicity. Uh, and it's reflected so minimally, I think it's a good marker for meta control states. But I even believe that it could be the, the, the means to achieve that. So I could, I could imagine that the noise, the manipulation of your own noise in the brain of the aperiodic part of it is the way you open up yourself for new knowledge whenever needed or to eliminate or reduce the impact of experience or old knowledge uh, if you don't need it. Now, in any case, the, the noise reduction as assessed by the aperiodic exponent is uh, driven by difficulty, so it seems, uh, by top-down challenge. So whenever this difficulty is increased, you, reduce, you tend to reduce the noise more. It seems to be stimulus driven or stimulus specific in the sense that it does not, in, in no way, no, in no study we found any evidence for a kind of blocking effect. So that whenever you're in block X, that you generally reduce or increase the noise where as compared to, uh, to another block Y. Uh, so you wait stimulus and only then you change or do not change the degree of your noise. Um, we think that there are individual differences that can be assessed in resting state uh, situations. So it's a kind of traits. These traits do not fix your location, your personal location on the on the dimension, on the meta control dimension, but they they perhaps determine your starting point, where you come from, uh, and where you can go to. Uh, so you may still have range. 
but the range may be shifted more towards persistence or more towards flexibility. That may be good for considering that when you are looking for a job or other occupation. Um, and then uh, the last point is that mainly selection processes seem to be affected uh, in the sense it's not a state really that is that we're talking about, but a way of processing, a processing style that I think we have uh, captured here. Now, obviously many people were involved in this. Uh, here are the most important ones that I uh, referred to and thank you for your attention. So let me un... Thank you very much, Bernard. A real uh, true the, to the force. Uh, floor is open for questions. If you wanna... <laughs> Just unmute and, and uh, shoot your question, it'll be great. Maybe I'll start while people are uh, warming up. So I'll start with a tiny question and then uh, <clears throat> if we have more time, a bigger one. So in an attempt to connect uh, um, action slash uh, decision-making and, and perception, if you think about those bistable figures like the old woman and the young woman or the duck and the rabbit, right? And mm -hmm. do you think people that are in a state that's more flexible with higher noise, it, would it affect their bistable perception? Would it? I'm sure they'll feel, feel more comfortable with the, with the dual perception, but do you think the frequency might be different? There might, mm -hmm. what do you think about that? Um, I have two thoughts about this uh, and they contradict each other a little bit. Uh, but anyway, so the I first stable. is, uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, so the first is logically, yes, absolutely. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's the most obvious prediction and it might be a particularly nice um, paradigm uh, in, in the first place. Well, the other thought that makes me hesitate is that so far we were very successful, both in the kind of noise things that I presented today, but also in the previous, years where we try to manipulate conditions under which you may be more like this or more like that and then we saw how that how that worked and whether it translate transferred on other tasks and and so forth and so on um we were very successful uh when it comes to 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 response selection and response selection related stimulus selection but we were not always we were also not looking a lot into this but the few times we did we were not so systematically successful if it comes to perception now my given my theoretical background i do not believe in the difference between perception and action in the first place so that that is a stupid argument coming from me yes 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 and yet the truth is, so for instance, we had a, uh, we had, I had a, a PhD student who was working on global local because people in the global local field are having very similar ideas about possible states and possible biases and things like that. So we thought that smells like a connection. So let's look into this. And I have to say, so far, success is very limited. Um, so many things failed. Uh, again, there may be always good reasons uh, why that is, perhaps because we did, may not have done it well and we may have chosen the wrong paradigms and so forth and so on. But th this is the reason why I hesitate. So it's not a strong argument, but but my personal feelings for for the moment. Thanks. Illuminating. So <clears throat> let me just expand about my comment with the noise. I didn't I didn't say noise is not necessary. I, I just thought that what you call noise is not noise, is, is rather a signal as far as I'm concerned. So I'm concerned. Yeah, if somebody in a flexible mode, I would look at them also as creative and as more divergent thinking, as more associative. So even the rest um resting state will be more. You know, will be richer. It might look like a, like a noise if you look for a certain interpretation, a certain thought, a certain decision. But if these people are so creative and think about seventeen things, and you look only for one this decision, there, then the other sixteen might seem like a noise. 
But there's one word, one concept that, that you didn't mention even once, uh, but I'm sure that uh, you probably, not sure, but you're probably embedding it within what you call control, which is inhibition. The idea that we inhibit, inhibit uh -huh. alternative, why are you laughing? Uh, that, that's, a, that, that's a long, many conversations I had uh, with, with some, some, always the same people. Uh, so I'm a strong disbeliever in inhibition. Cool. Uh, and I, I, I was objecting this from the first moment on. So we, and, and, and here are a couple of, of, of reasons. So I, I should say that I'm coming from a region in Germany where people are extremely stingy. So they're like the Scotsmen of, of, of Germany. They, they like to keep their money to themselves and not spoiling a lot. So, and th that is my style of theorizing. So I like fewer concepts more than more, uh, which makes me very unpopular in, in, the, in, the, in the field. Uh, but anyway, so think about the two, thing, the, the two aspects that, uh, that or no, think about two things a capacity limitation together with competition. These two things, this is certainly true for the brain. The brain has capacity limitations. It has limited access to many resources and so forth and so on, and it is strongly competitive. Now, whenever you have, you combine these two characteristics, you have inhibition as a byproduct. That means that there must, there need not be anyone, any system, any intelligence, any homunculus being busy with inhibition because it emerges from the way the brain is. So capacity limitation and what's the other one? And competition. Competition. And this is like the uh, the uh, I, I don't know how you how you call that uh, the where you have you you know the child's game where you have one chair less than people and they dance musical around chairs. The musical chairs musical yeah. chairs oh yeah yeah okay in Germany we call that the the travel to Jerusalem for some reason <laughs> anyway uh, so, but I have no theory about this. <laughs> so, uh, and, and the, the point is that whenever I take a seat and there is nothing left for you, this is not because I inhibited you, but because there is a capacity limitation and a competition. And I just, when there is a, there will be, and there, it makes no sense to invent extra capacities that produce the losing. Because if you would believe, let's say, if you would have a system where you build all the, let's say, the intentional stuff. So the intentional route in a dual route system, let's say, in Kornblum's system, for instance, if you're a kind of flanker person, then uh, you think about all the intelligence. What information would that guy need? It would need to know what, what not only what is the stimulus, but also what is the response and what is the mapping between them? So, okay, now think about the inhibiting system. What is the information the inhibiting system needs? Exactly the same, because it cannot inhibit just particular responses because typically the, the activated responses are valid in the task. They are just not fitting with the stimulus. And second, it needs to know the stimulus and the mapping. So both systems, so we would end up with two systems that have identical information. And I just cannot convince myself to believe that mother nature has built two identical systems to do one job. So this is this is the reason why I just and again, if you look into Miyaka's work, they came up with the three components, blah blah blah, and then one was inhib inhibition. Now, if you read, if you go seven or eight years later, I think two thousand and then two thousand eight was the one with the genetics or or something, and then they made this big pile, this big analysis on many, many people. And they found out that the inhibition, inhibition factor was actually the general factor. It was, I think, so they no longer needed this. And this, this is my, 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 my way of saying it's an, a property of the system 
and of the way the system works and not a, a, a dedicated system that is separated from, from all of that. This is just the brain's way to do things. And so that's my complicated story. I think it's very interesting. I'll have to think about it more, but very uh, creative for sure. <laughs> uh, yes, Michal, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I must confess that uh, as opposed to your, uh, you know, very abstract uh, discussion right now, I was actually stuck to, uh, at one point during your lecture when you said that uh, you said that the only uh, solution to the man glue star must be super, yeah, one of the remote associate um, test yeah. uh, readers. And I think uh, we, we are limited in the way we measure creativity because uh, this is one well-used solution which is supposed to represent convergent thinking. But for example, if you would allow complete freedom of go with every association. This is what happened to me when you said, no, this, this must be the only solution. It's not. I can use white. I can use golden. I can use shooting. A shooting man, shooting glue, a shooting starlight is nicer. Light glue, light man, starlight. You know, it's you can go uh, divergent, no, no. not convergent. So uh, okay. yes, <laughs> scary, I mean, just a comment. Yeah, yes, and, yes and no. I, I think the the... Uh, first of all, I mean, creativity, like any, any, any word, any concept in our discipline is just useless because it is taken from natural language, which is not made for separating things. It's ma made for pinpointing things in a circumstance, under certain circumstances. Uh, anyway, but so if you say, all these limitations, I, I, we, we're on, on, on the same page, but but this particular task is 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 there. The, it's very clear because it's a semantic uh, constraint that you can combine those words with the other one, and you can combine. You can say Superman, but you cannot say white man in the same sense that you can say white supermarket. So. It's, it's referring to the, and that constrains the task because it is culturally bound, bound. it is uh, de depending on your lexicon, which is all bad. I, I fully agree. I mean, that's that's easy to, to agree on. Uh, but in this particular version of the task, it's relatively clear that there is just one response, the way responses valid responses are defined now whether that is a good thing to define it like that that, that that's a whole different discussion that i'm i'm happy to have but that is only the only thing i meant any other questions go ahead omar and um, professor Arnold, thank you very much for the talk and um, was wondering if you think uh, there's any physiological way of the brain to mediate the noise reduction. I know that uh, in your earlier work with uh, Colzato, you spoke about uh, blinking. Yes, I mean the we are not the only ones. Uh, everyone believes that who, who, let's say everyone who is kind of sharing this meta control story from in one way or another. There are several versions of it. Uh, is believing uh, in dopamine. Uh, why? Because first of all, I mean, the first assumption is neurotransmitters need to be involved in any case. Why? Because if there is something, if something exists like a style, like if, if, you're, if it is possible to change the style of processing, it, we are, cannot talk about content. It's not about particular things of stimuli or, or actions or something. It must be something the way. Now, the way of processing needs a lot of area being affected. So it, it cannot be just one signal targeting a particular area or something. That would be too little. It must be something that affects quite some space, some quite some, if, if response selection is affected, if memory is, so it, it, it must be something like a neurotransmitter in the sense that it must spread 
in order to to affect many types of processing in many different uh, areas. So that makes it logical. Now, dopamine is has often been assumed in various ways. Uh, with, uh, let's say Holtz, uh, or Roshan Holtz and Desposito's work is on has a lot to do with patients with Parkinson's, and they have used often on and off drugs. Uh, and there, you can make very nice predictions uh, that all hold. Uh, so uh, this so. And others have more used like signal to noise ratio. They are coming from a different angle. So, for instance, uh, Cohen, um, uh, Jonathan Cohen, has early on already assumed that signal to noise is somehow related to dopamine, and dopamine that is somehow related to cognitive control and so forth. So, there there, there are different ways people are telling the story, but they they all more or less end up with dopamine. Now that as such doesn't make it much easier because dopamine can do many things. It depends on which receptor families are involved, as Durstevitz would say, um, and, and so forth and so on. So for instance, the eye blinking we took as a very cheap, a very proxy proxy, I, I have to say, but we, we thought, why not trying? Um, it also is probably more strongly, uh, let's say, reflecting the striatal dopaminergic levels, but not so much the prefrontal. Uh, there are interesting other measures, like um, the eyes are also fueled by dopamine. It may be related to the, the so the retina, uh, and uh, and that may be related related to the prefrontal. Uh, uh, stream. So the color perception and changes therein might be taken to reflect uh, individual differences in prefrontal dopamine. So if you're interested in cheap measures, they, they have to be more ri rigorously uh, looked into, but we looked into a sum. Uh, and at least it is related to, uh, to meta control. That so much I think I can say. Now, it's almost certain that also serotonin plays a role, but this is even more horrible. So we know so much less about serotonin. It has so many more receptor families involved and they sometimes do the exact opposite of each other, which makes it extremely hard to make any prediction. Um, and that, if that also interacts with, uh, with uh, genetic uh, predisposition, then you're really lost. So this is not much more than flagging a few, let's say giving some pointers, but whether this already allows us to make very specific predictions, not yet, I would say. I think we need another 30 years uh, probably to get there. Thank you. Looking forward to seeing your work in the next uh, 30 years. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, may not survive that period, but uh, let's see. <laughs> Okay, thank you again, Bernard. That was really stimulating. Very was, welcome. That's appreciate your time, and uh, looking forward uh, to hearing you again. Yes, very Bye -bye. welcome. If you have questions, just send me an email. I can send you pointers to summary papers or something of that sort. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bye -bye, guys. Take care. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. bye.